7 to 17. Listen for God's word to us today and also to the people of Israel that day. The Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so that you may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You are the one who shall command the priests to bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, Draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that among you is the living God, who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gergeshites, Amorites, and Jebusites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. So now, select twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, when the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan flowing from above shall be cut off. They shall stand in a single heap. When the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the ark of the covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So when those who bore the ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zarephan while those flowing toward the sea of Arabah, the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off. Then the people crossed over opposite Jericho. While all Israel were crossing over on dry ground, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Mark. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. And a large crowd were leaving Jericho with them. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up. He is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is the second Sunday of Lent, so those pancakes that uh, were served in this special place two Sundays ago, as sort of a Shrove Sunday, 
are long cold. The aroma of the bacon that day has sadly dissipated. I can smell bacon any time, love it. But that's gone. And the king cakes were predictably eaten up. So we're well on our way through the 40 days of preparation for the trials and passion that will face Christ during his last week on earth. This Lenten season is a time to focus on what it means to be a follower of Christ. It's a time of preparation. It's, it's also a time for individuals and faith communities, just like us, to turn around, to change direction, and to repent. The time to acknowledge and confront our own mortality and to be willing to die to our old sinful selves. And in dying, we're enabled to live for Christ. For without that dying, we cannot be raised to new life. So without death, you see, there's really no resurrection. And this year, in the midst of Lent, we world citizens have added to that sinful mix of stress and fear a silent, invisible, global virus popping up all around us. So between the demands of Lent and the threat of COVID-19, I believe this is a perfect day to remind ourselves of what courageous faith looks like. For we will surely need it in the times of the cross. So a story. This was told by a Methodist bishop. You may have heard of him, Will Williman. I'd like to share this with you. A few years ago, he wrote, during the crisis in Lebanon, a reporter was interviewing a few Americans remaining in Beirut. The hostage crisis had prompted then-President Reagan to order all Americans out of the country. All Americans were ordered to leave Lebanon. But a reporter had found an older woman, a Southern Baptist missionary, <clears throat> who wasn't leaving. The president did not send me here, she told him pleasantly. I'm here at the behest of the Southern Baptist Foreign Mission Board. The reporter countered with, the State Department has said that it cannot guarantee the security of Americans in Lebanon. From what I can see, the woman said, the State Department hasn't made us very secure here at any time. She said with a twinkle in her eye, my safety is not based on the state. Don't you have family in the U.S., persisted the reporter. If you stay, you will be arrested and fined when you return to the U.S. Yes, I have family. Would you like to see pictures of my grandchildren? But the people of Lebanon are also my family, she said. Do you think that the American government is going to arrest a grandmother going through customs at Kennedy Airport? <coughs> Besides, the case would be tied up in the courts until I die. I still have much work to do for Christ. I'm staying. Friends, this woman shows what it means to be a disciple. When she heard the word read and proclaimed in her youth at some point, she somehow heard her name called. She came forth to serve Christ. She faced this broken world and on and persisted in Christ's work. She is living proof of the continuing power of the gospel. And in today's language, we would say that she is all in. She is all in. And the text that we just read echo that faith of this woman. Her story is what I would call courageous faith. Courageous faith is steadfast and it's reliant on God in the face of hardship. 
And that kind of faith provides one the courage to take bold action or to stand up for another in need, all in the name of Christ. Have you ever considered that faith is often sourced from what we have heard or received from others? Yes, faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit, but it can be strengthened by what our family may tell us or what we hear in church, including the repetition of faithful stories like we've heard today. And that's the function of this Joshua text. Telling the people of Israel this story over and over again helps faith grow. The miracle provided by God to enable the Israelites to cross a swollen Jordan River would support their faith by reminding them that God is powerful, God is in control, and God fulfills God's promises. God promised them. That land. A swollen Jordan wasn't going to stop. So any time that you read about water in the Bible, I encourage your ears to perk up. Okay, that's a that's a little hint of something important is happening when you see water. For water has the power to bless as well as curse. It is both the source of life and the source of death as we see in tsunamis, flooding. And because water is outside human control, it becomes a sign and symbol of God's power and God's promise. So whether water is involved in the chaos of creation, or with Jesus walking on the surface of the Sea of Galilee, with Peter struggling whether he was going to drown, the presence of water is often a threat. But when water is present in the baptism of Christ or the baptism of each other, it is a sign of God's blessing. So water matters. And so here in Joshua, we have another story about water. We may all remember from Sunday school who fought the battle of Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And the walls came tumbling That was a common Sunday school hymn when I was growing up. But we don't often hear about how they crossed the River Jordan with that Ark of the Covenant in tow. And it, it's not the first time that the Israelites have crossed the body of water. You remember, Moses led the people through the Red Sea. They began that crossing as slaves. They emerged from the Red Sea as free people. So this crossing of the Jordan, led by Joshua, successor of Moses, that purpose was to lead the people on their final approach to God's promised land, a land for displaced people. Displaced people. There's a lot of them today, too. Notice a very important element. The, the priests carrying that ark were not allowed to just stop at the river's edge and wait for God to act. No, the, the, you heard the words. The priests were strictly told to step into that flowing water before God would act. They had to have faith first that God would eventually act once they took those first steps. And once those piggy toes were all in, their faith would be rewarded. So while God often takes the initiative with us, sometimes we, we have to take a step of faith before we can receive the full goodness of God's merciful blessing. And so telling and retelling of this story among the people of Israel is intended to memorialize this event so that it will loom large and become embedded in the memory of those people for the rest of the age. So the message for us to take into our DNA, our backbone, is that God accompanies, protects, defends, and liberates the defenseless in all ways, in all times. It's 
not a story about the past, it's a story for the present as well. It is our God who makes a way out of no way. And so while the Red Seas and the Jordan Rivers of history represent barriers to us humans, they are not barriers to God, obviously. In God and with God, the people will overcome. I'm sure you've all heard the expression, a leap of faith. It was a leap of faith taken by this American Baptist missionary working in Lebanon that allowed her to follow God's call and to stay to help the great Lebanese people, even when she faced extreme danger. And certainly a leap of faith, or perhaps more descriptive, a tentative, wet step of faith, is what the priests were instructed to take in our Joshua text. Their actions showed the people of Israel, and therefore, us, several millennia later, what courageous faith looks like. In the Gospel of Mark, we meet Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. This story is one of nine healing stories in Mark. They're just strung together beautifully. But it's the last healing story prior to Jesus moving to the cross. And it's the only healing story where the person who was healed has a name. Bartimaeus, Barney's son. Timaeus is his father, so he is Barney. There's some very important elements of this story that are critical to our faith today and to our presence here as the New Covenant Fellowship. First, Bartimaeus represents a very gutsy persistence and a perseverance of faith that will not be silenced. I can't imagine myself shouting and yelling at Jesus. But that's Bartimaeus. Somehow he had heard about Jesus, and now he perceives that Jesus is near. He literally yells his head off. If he had not yelled, would Jesus have stopped? Would Jesus have just gone on unhindered, unhindered toward Jerusalem? But Jesus did hear him, and our text says, Jesus stood still. He stopped. Jesus heard someone in need, and he stood still. Well, Bartimaeus may be blind, but he is not spiritually blind. Did you notice what Bartimaeus calls Jesus? He called him Son of David, a title related to the coming Messiah. So up to this point, only Peter, disciple Peter, has previously used this title for Jesus. But our blind beggar, Bartimaeus, knows that this is God. How awesome is that kind of vision? The rest of the disciples have struggled with just who Jesus is for the three years they've been with him. But our blind beggar can see the divine better than all of the sighted people around him. Well, this was Bartimaeus' one and only chance for healing, and he is going for it. Notice that Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? you know, we might react to Jesus, is it obvious what Bartimaeus wants of you, Jesus? Come on, Jesus. But Jesus wants to hear what Bartimaeus wants. He wants to hear what's most important to Bartimaeus in that moment. And so Bartimaeus, like others who are healed by Jesus and Mark, he, he's desperate. He knows what he wants and what he needs. He wants to see it. Well, I believe every week here in Covenant, when we do prayer and praise time, I hope you know how unique that time is here. I've been on hundreds of churches. This is a very unique time together. But I believe during that time, we are answering that question from Jesus. We are telling Jesus in our prayers what we want him to do for us. For he shows us in this story 
that He will stop and He will stand still for us. We know that He will be touched by our spiritual blindness. He will understand that. He will understand our poverty of spirit and by our social isolation or imprisonment or whatever is holding us back from being full disciples of Christ. We know this by this story and so many other healing stories that Jesus stands still for us. And as a result, our whole lives and the lives of our loved ones will be transformed, healed, and made whole in ways that we cannot predict. One other thing. Notice what the crowds are doing in this story. It's like water in the Bible is so important. So are the crowds, always. When you see crowds in the Bible, be ready to see ourselves. Here the crowds essentially tell Bartimaeus to be quiet. They're of no help or encouragement to him. None. Why should he, a worthless beggar, bother the rabbi, Jesus? But their attempt to silence Bartimaeus only makes him shout louder. Son of David, have mercy on me, he screams. And as soon as Jesus stops and says, call him here, the crowds get all pious and hospitable, saying, take heart, Bartimaeus. He's calling you. So how quickly the crowd, like weak sheep, turn around to get with the program. One last thing. Did you hear the words that Bartimaeus throws off his cloak and springs to Jesus? His cloak is probably his only possession. He throws it aside to get his chance with Jesus as quickly as possible. That's like one of us coming up to church here this morning, any morning, turning over the keys to our car to one of the beautiful people walking our dog. And then giving our keys to our house to the next one walking. And then the password to our savings account to another one passing. Bartimaeus does what Jesus asks of his disciples. He gives his all, giving his life to Christ in discipleship. Friends, Bartimaeus is all in. So I began today by reminding us that Lent is a time of turning around, changing our lives toward a life with Christ. That is what Bartimaeus did with his healing. Notice that he then followed Jesus into Jerusalem. Jesus didn't say, you know, go back or don't say anything more about it. That time had passed. Bartimaeus was now really the last disciple before he entered Jerusalem. Earlier in this service, we sang a very familiar hymn, Amazing Grace. And I guess you all have sung it dozens of times, if not more. I don't know whether you know much about it. The words were written during the American Revolution, 1779. You might have noticed the author below on the screen. His name is John Newton. He was a former slave trader who, through the power of God's grace, turned his spiritual blindness into sight and a repentance of what horrible things he had done to other human beings. John Newton, slave trader. The first verse of that song, listen to that verse. I'm not going to sing it, I'm going to say it. But think of it now in the context of John Newton. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Think of that new gift of sight for John Newton. Anytime you sing those words from here on out, we all have our blind spots. We allow children to be caged without rising up in outrage. We allow people to go hungry in our city. We do not marshal the food within our control and easily give the spare resources that we have in our pockets to fill the bellies of others with food along with a new hope for the future. We're okay with the homeless that bang on the street corners we pass to get to and from this church. We do that without saying, this shall not stand in God's world. So Jesus can heal our blindness if we, like Bartimaeus, are ready for the call of Christ and are willing to follow him, which means to obey his teaching. And like the story of the priests getting their feet wet and the miracle of sight given to our blind beggar in Bartimaeus, the message for us is that God accompanies, protects, defends, and liberates the defenseless. We have a God who makes a way out of nowhere. So what do you want Jesus to do for you? We know that he wants to hear us we know that he will stop for us and stand still when we speak. Our Bartimaeus story shows again that God's mercy is always present. Always. I've always loved a quote from a preacher, pastor, theologian named William Sloan Coffin. William Sloan Coffin. I don't believe he's still alive, but he was certainly a pastor in the late 19. Here's what he said. He said, I love the recklessness of faith. I love the recklessness of faith. First you leap, then you grow wings. First you leap, then you grow wings. The Baptist missionary woman in Lebanon, the priest crossing the River Jordan with the ark, Bartimaeus, the new disciple, all show us what courageous faith looks like. May we all be gifted with courageous faith in these times of trouble so that with that reckless faith we can find courage to first leap and then grow wings. That is what disciples do. And when is the time to pray about how we might do that as individuals and as a community of faith? Let us pray. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.